I just wanted to say that it's intended to be a bit of a two Tuesday, two part Tuesday talk. Next week, today's going to talk, and we both are talking about communication dyslexia, but I have a feeling they're fairly, fairly different topics, which maybe is good. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is I have to admit it's 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 new for me in the sense that I've been thinking about this for a couple of years, but I am not an out of common towards towards um, complexity theorists. So, um, yeah, it was my first time actually giving a general talk about this. So, ask questions, and if you know more than me, feel free to speak up. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to say that Adi Schreiber is the one who I have to thank for getting me into this. Um, about 15 years ago, I wrote a paper on uh, separating randomized from deterministic number unfolded communication complexity, and I'll tell you about it. But we tried to prove a non-constructive uh, separation, which seems like how, how hard could this be? We know it's so easy to do this in the two-player case. Um, <clears throat> anyways, we couldn't get a constructive separation, and I felt like, okay, I'm going to stop working on number unfolded. It's too hard. And then Adi came along about five or six or seven years ago and said, no, we really should work on this. And I said, why? And he said, well, it's, it's the same questions that they've been asking. He, he sensed that it was the same questions they've been asking in out of common torts. And I said, well, no, then we definitely shouldn't be working on it. But anyways, he convinced me. And um, yeah, I want to tell you about the connection and some recent results, mostly not mine, but recent results. <clears throat> yeah, and I've been thinking about this, like I said, for a while. With Nati Linnell Morgan, surely my student, Adi Schreiner, and Enlina, who was a student who just graduated from McGill. <clears throat> so you all know what communication complexity is. I don't have to spend too long on this. So the standard two-player number in hand model, you have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they each have an input that they're holding in their hand. So Alice holds X, so, you know, say a zero one bit string, Bob holds Y. And the model <clears throat> is a shared blackboard model. So they're trying to compute some joint function f of their input. And f could be a search problem or a partial function. Um, it's just some, something or relation about their input. Um, and there's some, the way they do this is follow some agreed upon protocol where each round some player sends some bits uh, that are based on their input that they're seeing and the transcript of the, the Blackboard conversation, which I'll call the transcript so far. And they go back and forth like this. And then at the end of the protocol, they should both know the, the answer. So the value of F on there. And the measure of complexity is the total number of bits. That, so if the inputs have length N, then the total input length is like 2N. And the measure of complexity is the maximal number of bits that they have to send to solve the problem F, um, <clears throat> where you're looking over all inputs of length 2N. Okay. And, <clears throat> You can generalize this to more than two players. Still, I'm staying in the so-called number in hand model. So, so for three players, they, now the input is partitioned into three pieces, and each of them has say, an even-sized piece, x, y, and z. And again, they're trying to they run some protocol where they take turns speaking until they all know the answer. And you can also add randomization to these protocols. So in the randomized situation for public coin, they would additionally share a big long sequence of random bits that they can use to, you know, that they all know. So it's sitting on the blackboard. And then the property is should be that for every input X, Y, and Z, the probability that they give you the right answer over the random coins is extremely high. Um, so why do we care about, um, yeah, number, you know, this two player or K player number in hand communication complexity. Well, for me, the, my main motivation is to prove circuit lower bounds. And it's been known for a while. Um, it's a result of Kirschman Vigris and that I think was actually apparently also independently discovered maybe earlier by Yanakakis, um, <clears throat> which is uh, basically they show that the formula size of a Boolean function could be completely characterized by the communication deterministic communication complexity of an associated search problem <clears throat> and the search problem so let f be the boolean function and then the associated search problem <clears throat> is alice gets an input that's a one of the function and um, bob gets an input that's zero, that's a zero of the function and they're trying to find some coordinate i where they're different where they differ and since the function is well defined 
um, you know, the ones and the zeros are different. And so therefore there always has to be some, if, you're, if they're given the promise that one of them has a one and one has a zero, then, then there's always a, a solution like this. And so it's a total search problem. And the goal is to find such an object. Okay. And what Karshman Vigerson proved is that the deterministic two player communication complexity of this is equivalent to the log of the formula size, of the best formula size, smallest formula size for S. Um, and there's also, it was generalized. Uh, there's a monotone version of it, but I'm not going to worry about that today. Um, and there's a generalization of, it, of this for circuits. So there's a way to characterize the circuit complexity of a Boolean function by the communication complexity of the same relation. But now the communication model is a DAG like model. And it's a little bit, takes a little uh, few minutes to define. So I'm not going to do that. Any questions? Great. So I just wanted to say that right, right from right here already, even before we get to number on forehead, we run into this issue that um, these, you know, to, in order to prove this formula size lower bound, which is equivalently stated as proving this communication bound, we run into this problem that uh, maybe you don't think it's a problem, <laughs> maybe maybe it, a priori maybe it's not a problem, but the search problem is always easy for randomized. Uh, communication complexity. So no matter what the function is, the karshman vigerson search problem associated with that function, which is, get, you know, they're given an X and a Y with the promise that you know, it doesn't even matter that X is the one of a function and, and Y is a zero. What matters is your, their promise that X is not equal to Y. And then they want to find a coordinate. And that can be solved with a randomized protocol by just doing a divide and conquer using the fact that equality testing of two strings are exactly equal, that has a order one randomized protocol. So they just run that protocol on the original strings. Well, they know they're not equal. And that, so that, let's say they run it on the first half to see if they're equal in the first half. If they are, then they recurse on the second half. And if they're different, then they recurse on the first half. So after log in many iterations of calls to equality, which is an order log in protocol, they will have solved this. And you can drive the error down as far as you want. You know, uh, you can amp amplify the error down without too much of an increase in complexity. So the reason I think there's a problem is that we don't have too many methods to, to prove lower bounds for functions or search problems that are easy, randomized, and hard deterministic. Okay. Um, the, basically, the main method for lower bounding deterministic two-player communication complexity is is the, to look at the matrix and lower and show that the rank is big, so over the reals. Um, and since a protocol, <clears throat> so you can think of a protocol, it's probably you guys know this, but any protocol, if this is, if this is Alice's inputs X and this is Bob's inputs Y, this is the communication matrix associated with the communication problem. So an entry here would be labeled with F of X, Y, whatever it is they're trying to compute. <clears throat> and a protocol, communication protocol, uh, basically partitions this matrix into sub-rectangles. Um, you know, if Alice speaks first, you know, maybe she partitions all of her inputs. Maybe on these inputs, she says one, and on these inputs, she says zero. Let's say she just sends one bit, and then when Bob speaks, you know, blah, 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 and so on. And so at the end of the protocol, you'll eventually have this whole thing partitioned into <clears throat> sub-rectangles. And it better be the case that, you know, if this is the final partition, say, it better be the case that all of these uh, entries in a, in a sub rectangle, which is associated with the leaves, that all of these entries have the same value, which is the value of F on all of these inputs. So this, these have to be monochromatic sub rectangles. Okay? So in particular, since these are either all, if, if F is Boolean, then these sub rectangles that the leaves are either all ones or all zeros. So that tells you that the rank of this matrix is at most um, two to the communication complexity. Okay. And so that's why you can get, if the rank is big, then you know that the communication complexity has to be big. Um, and the law of rank conjecture is basically the statement that, um, yeah, that, that they're more or less equivalent within, within polynomial factors. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, now, unfortunately, for, for uh, search problems like Karshman-Rigerson is not a Boolean function. 
it's a function, if it's not even a function, it's a search problem. So there's many different functions that could solve the search problem. Okay. And for in that case, it's it's even we don't even have rank because you'd have to basically show that any function that solves a search problem, the associated communication matrix has high rank. And so there's a quantifier in there that's going to be makes it much harder. Okay. And also, if, the, if it's a partial function, <clears throat> for example, even equality, we know that equality is easy to randomize. And you know, here's a picture of the, the communication matrix. It's just the identity matrix. So you can see that the rank is, you know, if there's n, if it's quality on n bits and n bits, then it's a two to the n by two to the n matrix. So, and that's the rank. And so that's why it requires maximal deterministic communication complexity. And even for three player number in hand equality, where it would be like a three dimensional tensor where the diagonals would be on, you know, on the corner, up, upper and lower diagonal, which would be a big one thing. Um, even there, it's easy to see that it's um, equality is easy randomized for any, any number k, easy to randomize for deterministic. But what if I gave you a partial, what if I gave you a distribution or a partial function associated with equality? Like it's not the full equality function, but instead I said, I'm going to give you, you know, I want you to solve equality with, the, with some promise that the inputs are a special type. And we're going to be looking at the... But what happens if you turn it into a decision problem somehow? Let's say you change the problem to whether or not there is a different bit in the first half, something like that. Are you asking about the... Yes, if you take the, the problem and instead of a search problem, you turn it like by force into a decision problem. Um, so still, if you did that, when it's a partial function, it might, I mean, it's a partial yeah. Function. So what is a partial function? So uh, by a partial function, you can also think of it as a distribution uh, over the, uh, maybe it's a subset, it's a sub, you only care about, so think of this matrix, if it's a, so if, if you have a, a total function equality, just to find out all inputs, up, up, I might restrict attention to just some subset of the inputs that might not be a nice product subset. And then I just want to know. To get to yeah. So it might be much easier depending on what this thing looks like. Like if they're all, you know, if they're all off the diagonal, then obviously it's easy. Um, and we're going to be interested in this version um, where it's three player equality. So we know that that's easy randomized um, and we know that it's hard deterministic, but now I'm going to have the promise. So I'm only going to be interested in inputs X, Y, Z that actually form a three-term arithmetic progression. So if I promise you that the inputs are of that type, then it changes the game completely. We'll see in a little bit why. <clears throat> um, this, my slides are mixed up. I'm going to skip the slide. It doesn't matter. Sorry, I don't have a slide for number on forehead. So number on forehead, I did have a slide. I'm not sure what happened to it. But anyways, number on forehead model is just like this one. So it's just like this model. It only really is different when you have more than two players. But the difference is that the input, uh, it, instead of Z being seen by this third guy, uh, the third guy, think of this as being on this person's forehead. So this, I forget who this is. This person sees X and Y. Okay? And Alice sees Z and Y, and Bob sees X and Z. Okay? So it's very different because the, now the bits before, all the bits of information were not shared. Every bit was owned, could be seen by exactly one person. Now each bit is seen by two people. Okay? So all of these bits are seen. Um, by by the sorry yeah okay I said either way all of uh, <clears throat> both Alice and Bob see all of Z and likewise for the other ones um, and again we can define the number on forehead communication plus the problem where you split up the input into the three pieces x y and z but now it's in this number on forehead setting and so since information is shared it might become much easier to solve problems in the number on forehead version than in the number in hand version. And so we can ask the same question given the function, what's the, yeah, what's the smallest communication complexity of a protocol for solving the function? And now we can also add randomness to this model. And again, um, that we, we have the randomized version of the deterministic version. <coughs> um, yeah, so number one forehead communication has a lot of applications that I love. 
um, just a few, but it's uh, <clears throat> the barrier, right? Well, it's been a barrier from the whole time I've been, <laughs> which has been a while now that I've been working in circuit complexity, but the barrier basically since, yeah, since I came in is to, is to prove lower bounds for so-called ACC circuits, which are circuits um, where you have uh, and or not gates and also mod gates. So you could have mod M or M isn't necessarily a prime. <clears throat> and it's not known how to prove. Uh, so, so there's a uniform versions. Well, yeah, let me just say that there's uh, for non-uniform ACC, we don't have uh, very good circuit lower bounds at all for like functions in NP. Um, <clears throat> and it's known that there's a normal form for this class ACC. And the normal form theorem says that if you have a function computed by a poly size, AC, sorry, ACC also means the depth is, is bounded by a constant. So the gates are pretty strong. They're arbitrary fan in mod M gates, arbitrary fan in and and or in negation. And um, the theorem states that you can basically squish the whole thing and it can be computed by, um, <clears throat> by a simple circuit, which is depth two, where the top gate is an arbitrary symmetric gate of its inputs. So that means the answer, whether it's one or zero, just depends on the number of ones coming into it. And uh, so it's a symmetric gate of, of small ands, ands of poly log fan n. Okay. Um, and the size of it is, uh, is, is quasi polynomial. So that's the theorem that you can kind of squish it into that form. So it basically looks like a, a, a low degree polynomial, okay? And um, because it looks like a low degree polynomial, uh, the karchmer vigerson game for this thing can be solved in the number on forehead model, as long as the number of players is more than the fan end of the end. So as long as you have more than log n, poly log n, fan n, uh, poly log n uh, players, then, uh, <clears throat> Then, if, if you could, so if you could prove a number on forehead lower bound or an explicit function in NP where the number of players in the number on forehead model is, you know, bigger than log n, it would be a big, big deal. So that's the first motivation. You can also do tricks to show that another huge barrier proving superlinear lower bounds for the circuits. Um, <clears throat> It, actually, the circuits have to have small depth, but even that's not known. So we don't even know how to prove lower bounds that are super linear for log depth circuits for linear functions. Um, and again, this uh, if you had number on forehead lower bounds, you could solve this too. Yeah. What number of forehead lower bounds do you know? Pardon me? What lower bounds do you know for the number of forehead? So there are there are nice lower bounds known for number. Well, there's the problem is there's only one technique, and it was in the Urbaba Nissan Segedi paper. And um, it, it's a it's a randomized lower bound technique, and um, basically it's like a repeated use of Cauchy Schwartz to get down to what is what to sort of get down to the two player case. It's a little bit hard to describe without it would take me a little while, but um, and and it holds for functions like um, uh, inner product. And then there was a, a big breakthrough uh, about 15 years ago. There wasn't, it wasn't known how to prove lower bounds for a function for, for a communication problem in NP like separate jointness in the number on forehead model. Um, and it was believed that you couldn't use that. It's called a, it's called a, like a discrepancy method. It's a, they used repleted Cauchy shorts to basically reduce to a discrepancy method if you know what that is and two player two. Um, so, so people thought that that didn't work because it was known that set disjointness, you know, doesn't uh, doesn't have uh, low discrepancy. And so, but nonetheless, uh, two groups of people, um, Shri Lee and Schreiman, the same Schreiman, and um, Arkadar Chattopadhyaya and um, I'm spacing. I feel like it'll, it'll come in here. And Neil Ada, who it is. So they managed to prove a generalized discrepancy method that allowed them to get lower bounds also for set disjointness. And then sure stuff came along and got extremely beautiful tight results. Maybe some of them are your papers too, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, very tight results in terms of, um, so the upper and lower bounds for functions like set disjointness. So I think the, uh, there is an upper bound of something like n over two to the k, or, and I think maybe you can tell me exactly what the best lower bound is now. Uh, it's something like square, square, square root of n over two to the k. Oh, four to the k. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so I think n over for set disjointness. That's the best alpha bound, and I think less k. The number of players. 
yeah. So you have a, a, a you have sets that are subsets of n. That's what the n is, and you have a, so yeah. So the inputs partitioned into so you have k yeah k sets each subsets of n, and you want to know if they're disjoint, like pairwise if you know the intersection of all of them is zero. And yeah, so I think something like that what you said. Square root of n over four to the k. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so there are as a result. That seems better than n over log of n for k. Yeah, but this is different because this is for a bo these are for Boolean functions, and I'm talking about for search columns. Wait, what exactly is the problem? You split one set between the k pairs and you want to know. No, no. So just like in the two player case, you have a set and I have a set. And in the k player case, there's k people and we each have sets. And we want to know is there a point in a common intersection? In the common intersection of L. all of k sets. So it definitely gets easier um, the more players you have, but because it because we're gonna run four heads. Is that good? Okay, thanks. Sorry, I'm not sure um, Yeah, lots of other applications. There's close connection to matrix multiplication. But today I'm going to talk about um, the last one, which is to sort of show that um, that for a lot of a large family of functions, which are going to be functions that are easy randomized and hard deterministic, most of them are going to be like that in the number and 400 model that the communication complexity of a lot of those functions and even the whole class of functions is closely connected to um, problems in additive comet source and Ramsey theory. So I'll describe that connection and then tell you about some recent results that improve slightly the, what's called, what's called a lower bound in additive comet source. And I'm gonna be calling it upper bound and I'll explain why in a minute. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to start with um, this question of uh, coming up with a separation. So just stick with, for most of the talk, you can just think of three players and I'm going to go ahead. Everybody clear what the model is? And I'm in the deterministic setting. Okay, and what I want to do is find a function, uh, or prove that there's some function, uh, you know, on, on a three player function, it's easy randomized and it's hard deterministic. That's, that's what I would like. That's what I wanted to do what, 15 years ago. And what we were able to prove to do instead is prove a non-constructive argument. And so I'll just outline that because it's really easy. Um, so that's the theorem. Um, I didn't tell you what the graph function is. Here's, here's the definition. So we're going to consider this huge class of functions called graph functions. Um, and so we'll, for k equals three, you start with a function f that takes two numbers in n and maps them to a third number. And zero through or zero or one through m, and you can think of m as being you know linear in n. Okay, and then the <clears throat> relation uh, or the this is the communication problem associated with this function is it takes three inputs and it should output one if and only if z is the right answer. So if z is equal to f applied to x and y, it's so simple. Um, <clears throat> and you can generalize this for any k. You know it's, now an f would map n to the k minus one, so k minus one um, numbers to a number, and again, r sub f would output one if the last one is f applied to the first k minus one arguments. Okay. <clears throat> and what we want to show is that, uh, so this is a slightly more involved argument that, that was obtained later by Lineal and Schreiber, and it's a little harder because you have to count permutation functions, so I'm just going to but it's, it's, it's very similar. So I'm going to show that, uh, I'm going to do a counting argument to show that almost all of these graph functions when n prime, sorry, that was n on my last slide. Uh, and on my last slide, it was capital N. And I apologize. <laughs> so so this is, my, this is a, the function f is taking little n cross little n to n prime. Okay. And I'm going to show that it requires very high communication policy. This is really big. So k can be much bigger than polylog. Unfortunately, it's a non-constructive argument, <clears throat> so we don't. We, I can't say that a particular function, it's like in NP or something like that, is is hard. <clears throat> but still, this is surprising. Like we don't usually get separations and 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 complexity theory in general between classes with a counting argument. So it's easy to use it for non-uniform models like circuits. So we we're you know it's easy to count functions, and there's way more functions than there are small circuits. But normally, when you try to separate two classes, it's it's hard to use a counting model. But the reason it's going to work is that we're considering this very special class of functions, um, and so we'll be able to for 
for protocols that solve graph functions, we'll be able to show that they can be put in a really simple special form that'll enable us to count protocols uh, to show that there's not that too many protocols. <clears throat> um, Show. Yeah, so first I want to, so to do the counting argument, I first want to show that, oh, oh, I just should say one thing first. So these, all these graph functions are easy randomized, every single one of them. And do you see why? It's just that um, the, <clears throat> so you have some fixed function f that they all know, and they want to know if f of x and y is equal to z, okay? And remember, we're in the number on forehead model. So Charlie, who sees x and y, he can compute f of x, y. So he can compute this z prime that's the right answer. And then they just have to run, an, he just has to run an equality protocol with somebody who can see z. So he and Alice could engage in a two-player randomized equality protocol to see if z prime is equal to z. Okay. So it has order one randomized communication complexity. And uh, we want to show that most of these functions are hard deterministic. Okay, so this claim, uh, oh, so, so, so that's what that claim says. And so in order to do the counter argument, we need this claim that's going to tell us that for these special graph functions that we can put them in this nice normal form. And the normal form is going to look like this. So if you start with an arbitrary deterministic protocol pi of cost C that solves some graph function R sub F, then we're going to, uh, come up with another protocol with basically the same cost. And in this protocol, Charlie's just gonna send C bits. So it's like a one, one, oh, not even a full round protocol. Charlie sends almost all the bits and then Alice and Bob just send one bit each and then they're done, okay? And the reason is just basically what we saw, kind of similar to what we saw before. So um, let's, you start with this protocol pi of cost C, it's a generic one, okay? Now Charlie knows, he can compute Z prime. So he can run the whole protocol. So he, he knows X and Y and he can compute Z prime. So he can run the whole protocol um, on X, Y and Z prime, okay? And then he gets the transcript of that protocol on that input and he sends that whole transcript to the other two players and that's the C bits, okay? And then the other two players, they just wanna check if, if that transcript is consistent with what they see. Right. So they're all trying to figure out if Z prime is equal to Z. So he sends the correct transcript if it was Z prime, and then they say whether or not they agree. <clears throat> okay, so I don't know if we want to do this, but, <laughs> but I'm just trying to count things here. So we have, so I'm back to M and N, I apologize. Um, so first, the number of functions that map, uh, and, so, and, and I'm doing the general case here. I don't know why I did that, but anyways. So the number of functions that take um, n to the k minus one, uh, you know, k minus one arguments, each a number, and n to n bits. This is the number of such functions. Uh, I'm counting. This is the log. Yeah, I think I'm doing log. Yeah, sorry. So this is the number of bits. Uh, so two to this is the number of functions. So this is the number of bits to break down one function. So for each of the inputs, you have to specify the output, which is log one bits. And now, so that's that side. And now we're going to count normal form protocols. Okay, so the so remember the first well, I think I think I said Charlie before, but one of the players. Um, <clears throat> First of all, uh, um, so if it's a D bit pro, so if he sends D bits, uh, then then the total number of of um, Oh yeah, so the transcript, remember, has d bits long, okay? So the total, so this is just counting the number of different ways that he could map uh, the input, which he sees, which is n to the k minus one, to, to a transcript, okay? And that's this, that's how many, uh, this is how many bits it takes to write down uh, this thing. 
and then <clears throat> for all of the for all of the entertainers one, and then the Alice and then the other two players or the other Kmos one players, they each send one bit, and you trust me that this is the number of choices for that. Because remember that depends on um, the transcript, the um, Uh, yeah, it's what they see for us, the, the transcript they receive and then they have it. At least that's what's it's the right hand side maps is exactly that. Yeah, what's the you know, if you if you look yeah. at the number of functions, that's what says that's you're counting what they see was the transcript that they received and what they answered. Great, perfect. Right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then yeah, as long as you and we had to pick m, which is the range to be slightly smaller. It doesn't have to be this this small. It can be n minus log k or something. You have to pick it to be slightly smaller than m, and then you get that the communication complexity is is basically maximal. So remember, this is bits. So since each of the players has an m, a number in n, it's log n bits. So the trivial protocol is is somebody sends their whole string. And um, this is really something like log well, again over over k, or as long as k is not you know, as long as k is like at most n to the epsilon. So, anyways, it's a very simple simple argument, um, and we tried for a while to come up with a particular function in this class that's where we could prove something, you know, something even polylog in the input length. <laughs> and I think what we were able to get was something like. I don't remember if it's log, 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 and or four logs and for a particular function, but we weren't able to get anything, you know, anything reasonable. So I don't really consider it much. It's a very weak kind of explicit separation. Um, okay, so today I want to. <clears throat> Connect some of these those questions to things in outer combinatorics. So first of all, I'm not going to prove this today. I can I can do it offline or just show you or I can give you the reference uh, that basically uh, understanding the communication complexity of the entire family of graph functions is almost equivalent to within fact you know a little bit of losses here and there to the construction of dense versus assimilated graphs. And then the second thing is we'll spend most of the time on this is we'll look at specific, uh, some specific problems in additive combinatorics that are well studied and formulate them as truly totally equivalent problems in communication complexity. They're uh, often going to be these graph type of functions. And, uh, and then we'll um, yeah, talk about some recent results here by, by viewing um, these additive combinatorics problems in, in this new way. Well, it's not really that new. Uh, Chandler first and, and Chandler first and Lipton in the first paper, I think from the eighties, already made made one. If you, ever, if you ever, I don't know if you ever saw their paper. It's really a beautiful paper. If you ever have a chance to read. It. <clears throat> yeah, so this is just to kind of set the stage that this whole family of graph functions is an understanding. It proved that lower bound. I'm trying to prove would be very significant. If you prove it also. From this from this extreme combinatorics point of view. So one, there's lots of ways to formulate this dense original summary graph uh, question, but uh, one of them is this one. So you're given um, an n by n by partite graph, and you want to you want the maximal possible number of edges in such a graph so that the edge set uh, can be partitioned into n induced subgraph graphs that are matching. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know. The full history of this, I told you I did, don't really work in extreme combinatorics, but it has a very rich history. This question, it's connected to the triangle removal lemma. Um, it's also been used to prove uh, in, in crucial parts of the proof of the PCP theorem. I think it comes up in streaming and, and it has something to do with um, broadcasting through certain types of channels. So I'm just telling you what I read on Wikipedia, but anyways, it has a very long history. Um, <laughs> And, and has a lot of applications. And what's known, it's sort of, uh, I think there's slightly better things known for other re regimes of, there's significantly better things known for other regimes of the parameters, but the, for this version, 
essentially the best that you can do is you can use, I'll tell you this is in a minute if you don't know. So you can use this famous old from the 40s construction of a large three arithmetic progression free set uh, due to Bayron. You can use that to come up with a graph G with that many edges. And on the other side, you can use the summary regularity lemma to show that any such G uh, has, you know, can't have more than that edges. And so if you look at the denominator here, the log of the denominator, um, so you can think of this, this thing here is like the communication complexity of the, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll get to it in the next slide, but, but you should think of this as being an upper bound on the equivalent communication complexity problem, which I'll put in the next slide. And this is the lower bound on this communication complexity problem. I'm sorry, this isn't, this, this isn't actually, I don't think this is actually optimal anymore based on stuff that I'll tell you later. This is the optimal uh, 10 years ago. Um, so again, yeah, this is like informal, but using a bunch of reductions, you can show that um, constructing optimally dense series of stem radiographs is basically equivalent to um, understanding the minimal number on for communication complexity of this class of graph functions. And uh, so it's actually not all graph functions, it's the little injections, but, th but this is a little easier to understand. So permutation functions, or just functions that are from end to end. Um, so it's where it's a permutation. So uh, if you looked at the, <clears throat> yeah. So for every, basically for every, um, yeah, that's not worry about this. So it's a specific, it's, so you want these to be one-to-one -one, basically for every, for every X and Y. Um, so, yeah, I can explain it to you. It's, it's not going to come up. Um, uh, yeah, so, so more or less understanding these, uh, the best, the, the densest bruiser stem radiographs is the same thing as understanding like explicit lower bounds for some graph function. So in the sense of the, if, uh, um, pardon me? What is the relation between this capital N and the lower case uh, I, I think I think I'm using them interchangeably. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to not uh, I'm trying to not ever use little n to mean the length of n. So I always use log capital N. So if I say little n, it's, it's just the thing that's big n. So if the ex explicit, uh, I would imagine it's if you want an explicit rule somewhere. Explicit, absolutely. So, so yeah, yeah, sorry. You could also do like counting on both or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah, and just to point out, like this is coming from the fact that we'll, we'll get to this soon. This is, this is coming from the fact that there is uh, a graph function, which is the, the one where you take for k equals three. The graph function, you take three numbers and you want to know if they're all equal to n, if they sum to n. So that's a special, special, very special graph function called exactly n. <clears throat> and it's using Bayran, you have this great upper bound on the number and forward communication complexity of that function, where, the, where instead of being log n, which is the maximal, it's just square root of log n. And that's kind of what gives you so upper bounds give you constructions of dense graphs, lower bounds on communication complexity. Is that a better upper bounds if you only care about existence, not about... Yeah, I think that's what you were saying. It's a, it's a yeah, good but, question. There should be. The, I mean, for the graphs. Right, there should be, yeah. At least for, with this, at least with the regime of parameters I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, at least you yeah. would expect right, if there is a connection. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we're able to do the element counting, yeah. Yeah, so for the regime of parameters I'm talking about, yes. But it's not so useful, just like all the other combinatorial yeah. objects that we care about, you, you yeah. need to be able to use it. Um. So I guess, so I make sure I understand. So the conjecture is that the upper bound, the explicit upper bound of graphs can be improved. 
want to get it via lower bounds or then? Um, it's not, not really a conjecture. So the the it's more of like a, another way to view uh, trying to come up with dense. So coming up with dense resistance radiographs is can be viewed as coming up with um, uh, <clears throat> a graph function, a graph permutation function with low communication complexity. Okay, got it. So uh, this line of thinking uh, assumes that it's not like the, the right answer to the combinatorial uh, problem isn't exactly. affecting the exactly. Yeah, so I mean, get, so a question is, is there some other graph function that's, you know, that's much, much easier than exactly n? <clears throat> okay, so I want to spend the rest of the time talking about specific, uh, so this was about a family of communication problems and connection to Rouge de I'm going to here, I'm going to talk about specific out of extreme problems and out of computers and their communication counterpart and what we know about, about that. So here's a picture of the three I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about, uh, and I'm going to focus on colorings. So normally there's two quantities for each of these terms. So arithmetic progression, you want to come up with the, the R, there's an R number two, R K of N. And there you, I'm going to stick with K equals three. So, that, um, so there you want to come up with a large, largest possible subset of n that doesn't have any three term arithmetic progressions and c is the coloring version it's asking to color all of n so that no color class uh, has you know, so that there's no monochromatic three term arithmetic progression so if you can uh, if you have a coloring then um well, it's the other way around if 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 they're both basically equivalent. So if you have a large subset of N that doesn't have any three-term arithmetic progressions, you can do a translation of that subset. Uh, it's a little bit non-constructive, but you can do a translation of that subset to, to color the whole, all of it. Um, <clears throat> so that's, this is, you know, one of the most famous problems in, in out of combinatorics, understanding the, these numbers. And we're going to show it's equivalent to this communication problem. And so the I'm going to just right now see the version of it for k equals three. So the version for k equals three is you're given, it's what I said before. So you're given three numbers and they're promised to be a three term arithmetic progression. And you want to know if they're, if it's the true, if it's a trivial arithmetic progression, in other words, if they're all equal. Um, and for bigger k, this is the problem where, so you can define, um, so you can think of this thing as, so a three arithmetic progression, you can think of that as a degree one polynomial progression. In other words, there's a there's a um, there's a degree one polynomial. So the p of x one, the p of zero, when you plug in, uh, sorry, yeah, p of zero. So when we plug in zero for, for x, we get x one. P of one is x two. P of two is x three. So a normal three-term arithmetic progression, you can view it as what I'm going to call, you know, a degree one polynomial progression of length three. Wait, in which model is this? Uh, is this problem? Yeah, let me just. Yeah, let me just. Uh, it's not going. It's number in hand. Yeah, but let me just finish de defining it. <clears throat> okay, so this is a promise problem okay, for the k equals three case. You're given three numbers promised to form an arithmetic progression, and you want to know if equal. The more general case is you're given p numbers promised to form uh, a degree, a degree k minus one polynomial progression. K minus one and k minus two. So that means there's a there's a degree, whatever this is, polynomial where x one through x k are the first k, you know, p zero. X one p one, and you want to know if it's uh, if it's a degree one less. Is it a degree k minus three polynomial progression? And again, for the case of um, k equals three, you start off with the promise that's degree one, and you want to know is it a degree also a degree zero polynomial progression? And that basically means you know that it's that they're all the same. It's a degree zero polynomial, which is a constant, so that means that all these all these numbers have to be the same. Yeah, and here we're going to be in the number in hand model. 
So it's more restrictive. So the number in hand model, and again for k equals three, now the player C, first player C is X1, second player C is X2, third player C is X3. They know that it's a three term progression. They just, and under that, under that promise, they want to know if they're equal. So it's just the version of equality that might be easier. <clears throat> and it turns out it is easier. Um, and we're going to show that that's that this communication problem in the number in hand model is exactly equivalent to uh, the log of the coloring of the best coloring, the smallest color is exactly equivalent to the deterministic number in hand communication of this problem. And similarly, we'll show, well, this was already known. This was by Chandra first Lipton. They showed that the corners problem, which I'll define in a little bit, is equivalent to exactly N. And exactly N we talked about. Now we're in number on forehead. So you have K numbers on the people's forehead, and you want to know if the sum of them is N. So for K equals three, again, you have three numbers, and each player sees two of them, and you want to know if the sum of the three numbers is exactly N. Okay. And we'll show that this is exactly equal to this, this question. And all of these deterministic protocols? All deterministic, yeah. Yeah, I mean, these things are, are easy randomized. <clears throat> and then this partition KN just looks slightly different. Now the inputs are, are <clears throat> Boolean zero one vectors of length N, and you want to know if they form a partition of N. So view XI is a subset of N, and you want to know if the, you know, if, if the if it, S1 through SK, if they're disjoint, and the union of S1 through XK is N, you know, is, is everything. So this number on forehead in the number on forehead model, this is equivalent to the log of the best coloring and so on and so on. So I'll show you these a couple of these equivalences. And then we'll also see that it's known um, that if you have a construction of a small coloring for this problem, that gives you a construction of a small coloring for this one, which gives you a construction of a small coloring for this one. So so this, this thing up here is kind of like the, the main workhorse for almost all the stuff that's known in terms of what's considered lower bounds and aggregate component works. But I'm calling them upper bounds because the lower bounds for these things in aggregate component correspond to upper bounds in the communication. So I hope it's not confusing. So Bayer end is a Bayer end gives you a construction of a big set or a coloring with not too many colors. That in turn corresponds to a communication protocol with a small number of bits. So that's why I'm considering Bayer to be an upper bound, even though in the literature you always hear it called a lower bound. So I'm going to stick with my terminology because it's for me it's, it's more natural. <clears throat> so this is just kind of another picture. This is just a picture of the same thing. And again, the arrows here mean upper bound implies upper bound. And when I say upper bound, I mean well, here it's obvious if I have a protocol of a certain cost for this, that means I have a protocol for this of basically the same cost or less. And um, yeah, when I say up, so that since I have these arrows, I also have these arrows, and this upper bound applies this upper bound again, it means that if I have a coloring with a small number of colors for corners, then I can extract from that a, a small coloring for this problem. Okay. Do you need a break yet? Or do you? I want to make sure it's trivial, but the lower bound upper bound confuses me. So I know it's, it is confusing. So originally we wanted an explicit separation between deterministic and randomized, and now we we want something else. We want a, a low cost deterministic algorithm for stuff that's uh, um, so so I, I wanted both. So when the randomized versus deterministic, I'm, I'm very much interested in an explicit lower bound because um, that. Is it separation? But I'm also interested in knowing what's the easiest. You know, we have, we know that almost all graph functions are really, really hard. And the question is like, what's the easiest one? And that answer, which is you know just the dual of the original question, that turns out to be you know, what people study with dense. Yeah. So I actually care about both. But here I'm now going to be mostly. So it's an equivalence. So we care about upper and lower bounds. And I'm mostly going to be talking about how if you. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's very useful, I think, to, to think about the, the constructions like Bayrand and follow up constructions as number to convert them. Sometimes it takes some work into explicit number and forward protocols or number in hand protocols. And sometimes then it's just like easier because it, 
I don't know, somehow it's easier to see how to improve things. So you can mix and match your trips and you know you know what's going on more. So you are saying that the purpose of this is that you want to find the easiest number one for a deterministic graph function? Yes. Yeah. And here I really want... And what is the easiest one you know? Like so far? Exactly, yeah. So you don't know anything that is less than n. Oh, no, exactly n has cost. So the... Uh, the, the oh, the problem. <laughs> Square as a log n is like maximally hard. Okay. Uh, and and exactly n has cos square root of that. And that's the. So can you repeat this? What is the communication bound for exactly n? So for exactly n, k equals three. Each player has a number and yes. zero through n. So the length of their inputs is log n. And so yes. they could trivially they could be done by just one player sending and mm -hmm. and the exactly end protocol that you get from bayer end which i'll go over has cost square root of that so square root of log n and this is you don't know any any graph function for which you have a number on forward protocol with less than uh, okay. the permutation graph function <clears throat> okay um do you need a break Okay, should I go for 10 more minutes and a break? And I can't stop. Oh, where you're at. Um, I think I'm supposed to end at like 12, 15, is that about right? Yes, we'll take a break in about 10 minutes. Okay, so so first I wanna just show you uh, these, these arrows. Okay. And again, um, you can just have done it up here, which is already known. Um, but I, I find it easier to work to work in the communication model. So first I'll show you those, and then, then we'll see the equivalence, and then we'll see how the actually very recent results improve for the first time in a very long time. Uh, this finally able to uh, do better than Bayern. Okay. So first I want to show is everybody clear on what these problems are? So I'm just going to stick with k equals three. So just to make sure, and remember what they're here. Your number on forehead, three numbers, and n when they're equal. Here, a little bit weird. Three numbers is a promise if you're in arithmetic progression. Number in hand model, we want to know if they're equal. And here we want to know if their sum equals n. Those three numbers. Here we want to know if they're actually the three numbers are equal to one another. Okay, with the promise they're in arithmetic progression. And here again, we have three strings and zero, one to the n, and we want to know if they, part, if they form a partition of n. But you didn't define corners. Oh, I'll do that later. I didn't, yeah, I didn't do that yet. I mean, I think I did orally, but I'll have to slide. Okay, so I want to show how if I start with, um, uh, so again, this is upper bound for the number in hand degree problem implies an upper bound for exactly n. So I'm assuming we have a protocol, a number in hand protocol for this promise problem. Okay. And I'm going to use that to solve exactly n in the number on forehead model, k equals three only. It works for all k, but let's do k equals three. So the players uh, get, you know, it's number on forehead, the inputs are x, y, and z. So you know the first player sees y and z, every you know, there's three players and each of them sees two of the three numbers. Um, so we're going to let x prime, again, this, this is sort of like what I did before. I'm, x prime is the actual, if, if the answer is yes, so this is a graph function. So if x plus y plus z is n, then the player who sees y and z can compute what, what should be on his forehead for it to be a one. So x prime is the correct value, you need correct value so that uh, x prime plus y plus z is n. So the players can compute x prime, y prime, and z prime respectively. And then we'll let delta be n, that's the target for the sum, minus the, the so, so this is, you know, the difference between n and the sum of the three, okay? And x prime minus x is delta, so is y prime minus y, so z prime minus z, okay? And we're going to let t be this number. Nobody can compute this, but they're going to each try to compute this to the best of their ability. So the player who sees y and z is going to, uh, compute this 
using X prime. So T sub X is like a best guess as to what T is if you only could see Y and Z. So substitute X prime in for X, and otherwise it looks like T. And T Y is the same thing where we substitute Y prime and Z, we substitute Z prime. Okay. And because of, because of these three things are delta, this is T minus delta, this is T minus two delta, and this is T minus three delta. Okay. So they, these numbers form an arithmetic progression, always, no matter what X, Y, and Z they started with, when the players, the players can compute these numbers, because we're in the number one four item model, and these three numbers form an arithmetic. So the promise is met. So now, now we want to know if they're actually equal. So we want to know if delta, if delta zero, then, then you know, x prime is equal to x, y prime is y, and so that, that's the case where exactly n should output one. So we know that they form an uh, form an arithmetic progression, and they form a non-trivial one exactly when delta is zero, which is exactly when which happens when exactly, if and only if exactly n on the original inputs is one. So the players compute these three numbers and then they just run this number and hand protocol because these three numbers satisfy the promise. So they run these three numbers using this protocol to see if they're equal. So it's important to notice that they, they can compute these numbers, but then when they finish solving the problem, they, they don't use any more of their shared information. So they're just, just kind of because they're moving to the number at hand model, it means all the other common information that they had, they're just ignoring it. So this is the only information they're extracting from the number on forehead model, and then they're proceeding to the number hand model. Is that convincing? Um, Okay, and then now let's to see that if you had a protocol for exactly n, you could use it to self partition. This is even easier. So let s1, s2, s3, these are the vectors in 0, 1 to the n. So those are the, think of those as the subsets of n. And it's number on forehead. So we're trying to solve the partition problem, just that these three numbers form a partition in the number on forehead model. So the first player that sees these two things checks that they're that the ones are disjoint. Okay, so we want to make sure that it's actually uh, the three sets are disjoint. So the three players pairwise just check their sets. And if any of them has something in common, we reject. And otherwise, if they all, if all these checks work out, then we know that each of them, that, that they're disjoint. And then we can just count. So then we can run, if we have a protocol for exactly n number on forehead, the players run it on these three inputs, the length of S1, the number of ones in S1, the number of ones. So we want the number of ones to be exactly n. And if it is, then we know it's exactly partition. Okay. So that, that one's quite easy. Okay, so let me define um, the, let me, let me define the, the, the three things on the top. Um, Maybe I'm confused with the big N and the little N now. So the, the I really apologize. Yeah, I, may, I was working on this last night, obviously late. So, yeah, big N, little N are always going to be the same. The problem size shrinks in the last reduction, right? Because, oh, uh, the number of the tops logarithm. That's that's true. Um, yeah, but it, but but it, it's it, yeah, it's true. But I took that into account because. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it's okay, it does shrink, but that's because exactly n, you're supposed to have numbers that are numbers as input in, in zero through n. So the, the bond is the, the same, the input length changed. Yeah, yeah. A bond is the yeah. same, but the input yeah. length is exponential. Yeah, exactly. It's really large. Yeah, but you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm not going to talk too much about tails to it and partition just because I, it's, I, yeah, there's too many things to talk about. So I'll mostly focus on the, the, the yeah, so the left or right, the right too. <clears throat> okay. um, yeah, and just to make it clear what 
before I define these, what I mean by this. So this arrow is going to basically, it's not, it's not, it's going to be, we have to convert to log. So it's going to say that the log of this, what we're measuring here, which is the smallest number of colors to do something, uh, that the log of that is going to be essentially equal to the communication complexity of this problem. The number on forehead means number on forehead. So we just have to take the log. Okay, so, so C K of N is the minimal number of colors to color all the numbers in, uh, in, in N such that there's no monochromatic K term arithmetic progression. So that just means, you know, I, there's no number X, X plus delta, X plus two delta. So you want a coloring where in each color class, you don't have any three term arithmetic progressions. And RK, I said this before, but RK is the size of the largest subset with no K term arithmetic progression. Um, and I'm going to be interested in um, yeah, what, what's called lower bounds, uh, what I'll call upper bounds. I'm going to try to construct colorings with the smallest number of colorings possible that don't have any three term arithmetic progressions or K term arithmetic progressions. <laughs> okay. And I already kind of talked about this, but again, uh, we're going to show that this CKN is equal to log of the, the number in hand communication complexity of this promise problem for K plus three. So again, this promise problem is what we just said. You're given these three numbers, number in hand promised to be a three term arithmetic progression, and we want to know if they're all equal. So I want to show you. I want to show you this equivalence and do the same thing for corners. Um, but let me just do this equivalence in there. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going. So first, I'm going to show if I have a protocol for for this degree one zero problem, then I can use it to construct a coloring. Okay, so let pi be this protocol <clears throat> for this degree problem, <clears throat> and then I'm going to construct this coloring from this protocol. <clears throat> so for any number W and N, I'm gonna, the color I'm gonna give it. So I'm gonna think of all the possible transcripts of this protocol, pi, as the colors. So there's gonna be, if the protocol has cost, communication cost C, there's gonna be two to the C colors, two to the C different transcripts. And I'm gonna color a number in N with the transcript when we run the protocol on W, W. But all the three inputs are the same. <clears throat> Okay, and then all of these are the, all of the, the transcripts that I'm mapping numbers to, they're all accepting transcripts, right? Because uh, WWW is, you know, they're all equal. And so they're all accepting transcripts. And well, now I want to show that it's a legal, it's a three AP free color. Okay? So if you do have, let's say that you have these three numbers that form uh, the three term arithmetic progression, and if they got the same, color, in other words, they got the same transcript, then, then the protocol, then this protocol would err because this is, um, this is, you know, an example where it's prom it is promised to be an arithmetic progression, but it's not a trivial one. So the protocol should say zero on it, but it's associated with, with a transcript that's an accepting transcript. But I understand that the protocol is of www, so it's on x1, x1, x1. Uh, uh, okay, so, so the protocol pi takes its input three arbitrary numbers that are in arithmetic progression. But, but uh, on the arithmetic progression that are trivial, so when you give it, when x1 equals x2 equals x3, and then that's the case where the protocol says yes. Yeah. So I'm gonna give uh, the, each number, the, the color I'm going to give it is going to be correspond to the transcript when you when you run the protocol on this triplet. X1 is W, X2 is W, X3 is W. I guess, I guess it's very important that this number has. Yes. Right? Because what is going on here is that yes. X1 is going to run a protocol imagining that everything is X1. But because it's monochromatic, the second guy, x1 plus delta, is also going to run the same protocol and going to get the same transcript because it's more chromatic. That's right. But, but he has a different input. Right. Uh, but but the, because it's more chromatic, he's seen the same transcript. And then it's nonsense because it's, 
they are actually different, but they're running the same transcript. But they only have the information about their own plan. Okay. okay, I'll do the other direction and then I think we'll take a break and I'll skip the second equivalent. Well, I should skip it. I, I want to get to the last part of the talk, so I might skip it. And I'll do the other direction. It's just a, just a, so now we want to uh, do this direction. So we start with a coloring, uh, and it's a good coloring. So there's no monochromatic three-term arithmetic progression. And now here's the. Now we want to construct a, pro, a number in hand protocol for this problem from using this coloring. <laughs> okay. So on the input x1, x2, x3 for this again, this is promised to be a three-term arithmetic progression. <laughs> Alice computes the color. Um, and this is supposed to be a number in hand protocol. So Alice is given X1, she only sees X1, Bob sees X2, Charlie sees X3. So Alice is gonna send the color of X1 to the other two players. And then the other two players will just say whether their colors agree. Okay. And if they do, if they all agree, if they color, then you output one, and otherwise you output zero. Okay, <clears throat> so, so obviously if the numbers are all the same, then they're gonna accept. So what happens if the numbers are different? And again, the only relevant case is where they form an arithmetic progression and they're different. So the numbers look like this. Um, so if they're different and they get the same color by chi, then yeah, you get a contradiction because then you have, then the coloring wasn't good, right? So if you have three numbers that form an arithmetic progression that are distinct, then the, the coloring, since it's good, is gonna give them different ones. So, so one of these guys is going to find the difference. So this, this direction is pretty easy. <laughs> okay, let's take a five minute break and then. Yeah, I'm just um, trying to figure out if there is. There doesn't seem to be anything interesting about free arithmetic progression specifically. Right, like if you have any any forbidden in this direction. Wait. I mean, I think you're, you're getting at a higher point, which I kind of agree with, I think. So you're saying lots of problems of this. I'm asking, okay, can you go back to the previous direction? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I'm asking the following thing. If I forget about three term arithmetic progressions and just say this is a set of uh, triplets, of, like a family of triplets in the numbers one to n, I promise to you that there are three inputs. Okay, so there's nothing special about this, just with the promise and the forbidden structure. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So that's what's happening uh, in, in a lot of these reductions. Yeah, there's some, you, you, want, you want to color things such that this forbidden thing is not ever there. And then that translates, yeah. But then you have to be a little careful on the communication side to make sure that you, to get the equivalence, you have to make sure you get exactly the right model, exactly the right problem. Yeah, but just couldn't you just do this kind of thing? There's a set of triplets called the promise, which is, I would promise you that it's there. Yeah. And there's a set of triplets, which are called the forbidden one. So you promise that it's there and you need to output one if it's in promise but not forbidden and you need to output zero if it's forbidden. Okay, say it one more time. So, so in this case, promise yeah, so, so I know what the promise is, what's forbidden? Forbidden, it, <coughs> so, so you have to output one if it's in promise but not forbidden. Yes, and you I, have see. To zero I see. If it's forbidden, right? Yeah. And then I think yeah, you I think you're right, that's a good point. Right. So yeah. now the, the follow-up question is. Yeah, but the fact that it switches to number in hand is that's natural to you? Um, Sorry, I, mean, I think both directions work should work. Right? Yeah, I, see. But, I mean, we'll see. We'll see that like the next one is not. It's maybe there is an. You're maybe you're saying that there should be a number in hand version. So we're going to do. There's one from corners to exactly n. Right, right, right. <laughs> we're just talking about this equivalence yeah. between the. Yeah. These two. <laughs> I thought you. Oh, I thought you were so like says that in this equivalence it doesn't yeah. seem really connected to active combinatorics or the specific thing. Just the fact that yes, at, at no if point you, you promise anything, you can show equivalence to 
uh, how can like how many colors do you need to color the numbers one to n such that there's no monochromatic structure of the pomes? I, I don't agree with you, but I think it is kind of subtle because with the corner thing, you um, yeah, 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 but that's the other equivalence. <laughs> But we're saying just the equivalence between these two okay, doesn't use any structure of the other arrangement. Maybe the next equivalence that you're going to prove, oh, yes, okay. but but this two is, is completely yeah, not, not related to it. Right, but then it seems like what you're suggesting is that I can take a different, uh, whatever you call them, promise and forbidden, mm -hmm. which would yes. be corners that would have that, and then I should be able to. Well, it, it will have that, but it will have that against the, the same promise forbidden version yeah. of arithmetic. Uh, well, arithmetic is not arithmetic anymore, but so, you're just yeah. distinguishing between yeah. number yeah. and hand communication complexity versus coloring. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So this yeah. I think this is the nicest one because it's like it's back to the equality and number in hand, which we think we understand and we really don't. And in general, we don't understand equality at all. So I think it's the roots of why we can't prove log rank. I feel like it's, and also like in the past, I think people either were number in forward or number in hand. And here it's really natural now to look at all the spectrum. Like at the one hand, everybody's, every bit is seen by just one person. The other hand, every bit is seen by K minus one, but you can consider all the stuff in between it. And it comes up when you look at the bigger K values of, so are you going to say something about uh, the P3 colorants? Yeah, yeah. You mean like... Uh, what is known about them? Yeah. So can you start again? Okay, so let me just do the corners one. Uh, and then we we'll get to the, the new upper bounds. Well, it's actually a temporary question. Yeah. Um, what happens if I don't give you any promises and you just want the number in, let's say, both, in both models, if I just want to know if the three numbers are equal or not? Do you have lower bounds for that if I don't give you any promises? Um, no, that's exactly, I mean, number and forward, that's exactly end. Uh, and that's where we have the square root login and the lower bounds are terrible. Sorry, I, there's been a lot of improvement on the lower bounds from, from that, but they're terrible. So from about take... like equality, like about all three of them being equal, not about some. Oh, with the three numbers being equal. Yes. Oh, sorry, you're asking just x is x1 equal to x2. I was trying to take the yeah, same when you said now and so just we the know forms. that that's hard. Um, yeah, number and hand number. Yeah. I mean, and, and number on forehead is. Uh, you want to know if all the three numbers are equal, they, they, it's that easy, just and, and anyway, because they can just pairwise check them. But in number in hand, it's it's because the matrix is just a big one. The rank is two to the end. Okay, so let's do the next one. So I'm going to stick with k equals two. So the two dimensional corners theorem is a uh, corner is a triple of numbers. Uh, again, x, y, all these numbers are bounded like they're most n. So you have a number x, y. So you can view it as a point in two dimensional space. You have a number x plus delta y, and you have a number x, comma, y plus delta. So it's called a corner. And this, this is a corner. Uh, that's what that is. It's not less than. So ck, and, and there's a generalization for it, but I'm not going to do it today. So just stick with k equals three. So this is the minimal number of colors to color n to the two, so all possible pairs of numbers, uh, such that there's no monochromatic k corner. In this case, two, two corner. Okay. And R is the you know the sub big set version of it. You want to find a largest subset as possible of n cross n uh, with no two corner. Again, these two are made basically equivalent because once you have a large subset, you can you do a translation argument to get a coloring from it. <laughs> and from the coloring, you, you just by averaging, there's a subset of size. And so we want to show that this, then this is old. This is from Chandra first and Lipton. I don't know if they quite stay this way, but I'm going to show that this 
again, pay equals three, the pay equals three version of exactly n number on forehead is equivalent to this, you know, this coloring problem. <clears throat> okay, so in this direction, let's say you have a number on forehead protocol for exactly n. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to construct this corner free coloring. Um, and uh, given a uh, pair XY, to figure out what color we're going to color them again, we're going to look at uh, where the colors are going to be the transfers of the protocol pi are going to be associated with, we're going to think of them as colors. And we'll run pi on this x1, x2, and then this is the, the you know, what, what, what the third value should be if the answer is going to be one unique third value. We'll run it on this, whatever the transcript is, that's the color we'll give this. And now suppose, and we want to show that this is a good color. So this is a, doesn't have any monochromatic two corners. Okay. So suppose it does, as we have this two corner, it's monochromatic, so it's all, it's given the same color. <clears throat> then um, remember the, the color that this gets is the, whatever the transcript is when you run it on x1, x2, and n minus x1 minus x2, okay? So this is, uh, it's gonna be this transcript and I'm just adding and subtracting delta, it's the same number, this is the same. And similarly, this one, I'm gonna get this color. So again, I fill in this one with the correct answer. So basically all three of these things are gonna to lead to the same transcript when you run pi on them, okay? Um, now this is called a star. Um, if you don't know what this is, I'll don't you know, I'll tell you later. But um, the one nice one nice thing about number on forward protocols, the only nice thing about them, it's not even so nice, is that that um, you can characterize the same way in a number in hand. Uh, you you the basic building blocks are subrectangles. In this case, the basic building blocks are called cylinder intersections. And what they look like, what a cylinder intersection looks like, is. So here's like a, if it's, so if we're doing k equals three again, so these are all possible x's, all possible y's, and in this direction, all possible z's, okay? So uh, a cylinder in the, let's say, z direction is a subset of x cross y, and then you extend it um, to all the z's, all possible z's. That's a cylinder in the x dimension, and you can come up with a cylinder in the y dimension, a cylinder in the z dimension. And when you take the intersection of all those cylinders, that's called the cylinder intersection. And those are the basic objects. When you have a number on forward protocol, it partitions all of the inputs into disjoint cylinder intersections. And these cylinder intersections better be monochromatic, you know, at the leaves, and they give an answer. And so it better be a good answer for all of them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So because, because of this property that you have cylinder intersections associated with the leaves, you can show an equivalent way of thinking about that is, uh, is has to do with these, these uh, inputs that form a star. So this is like an input where... Um, Which are two of them are equal. Exactly, yeah. So you can already see where... Yeah, so, so it's, it's very similar to regularity level for isographs. <laughs> well, the stuff's connected, exactly. So these things so-called form a star, and anytime you have a star like this, the center of the star, which is the one where you remove this, this addition of, so here you added delta to x1, here you added delta to x2, here you added delta to x3. So the center is where you just have x1, x2, x3, which in this case would be x1, x2, x3, okay? So the cylinder intersection property tells you that if you have, if you have three inputs that form a star, that are in the same cylinder section. In other words, they're given the same transcript, which corresponds to the cylinder section. Then the, then the center, which is in this case, it's X1, X2, and this thing is also has the same transcript. And that's really bad. It's good for us if you're trying to prove it. But, but this input is not a yes input, right? Because this, it's, it's delta is not zero. So these numbers don't sum to n. Okay, so, so then you got a contradiction. So remember, we wanted to assume for sake of contradiction that these three numbers are monochromatic. If they were, then we got that these that this uh, these three points that form a star uh, are monochromatic, and therefore the center of it is also the same follows the same transcript. It's an accepting transcript um, because you know because all of these are supposed to be accepting, 
but it shouldn't accept this input. So then we get a contradiction with this wasn't one. Um, I'm not going to do this version. It's, it's, I think it's too many reductions. So if that's okay with you. I'm just going to try to, yeah. You know. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to state so Hale's do it is <clears throat> um, you have. Now, instead of now the forbidden things are called combinatorial lines. So in three dimensions of combinatorial line, you have uh, uh, you have points in k to the n, and this case k is three, and n is two. So the blue things are all the different points, and a line uh, shown in green is is one where it's it's three points where they're in every coordinate they either run through all the three values or they're all same. So in this case, you have two, one, two, 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 three. So they're the same in the first coordinate, and they run through all three values in the second one. <clears throat> and this quantity is the minimal number of colors to color <clears throat> all of the points in k to the n uh, with no monochromatic combinatorial form. And this is the set, you know, size the largest set without the monochromatic line version of it. And I get the third equivalence is that this communication problem partition that we talked about is equivalent to, to the, this coloring. So the smallest number of colors is exactly the log of the best protocol for this. Okay, so what I want to do with the time that's left is, is actually talk about, <coughs> mostly talk about the middle one, the corners and the exactly in and uh, tell you kind of what's known and then the improvements that have been made recently, kind of, I think, using this communication approach. <clears throat> uh, so remember degree one, zero, that's the equivalent version of uh, coming up with a three AP free coloring. And this is, yeah, very old. The best construction is from 40, the only construction really is from 46. This is a slight improvement, it just improved a little over one term. I'm going to write it down, but I thought it was the point. Um, so that's essentially, you know, the best that's known. Um, on the other side? Um, uh, yeah, on the other side, I didn't do my research, but it's it's more like, it's numbers like log star uh, instead of square root of log n. So, and, and I know it's considered great improvements um, because the coloring raised that is two, is two to that. So the improvements look, look better <laughs> that way. Um, but, in, but in the communication world, they, they're, uh, yeah, where there's a huge gap, right? It's like where it's square root of log n is the maximal communication. The best upper bound is square root, which is, which is pretty good, even though it's still big. And the best lower bound of communication complexity is, is really something like, I don't know the constants, but log stars. Somebody can correct my kind of right. I mean, nobody knows. Okay. I hope I have it mostly right. Um, there's been a lot of work. Yes, yeah, Sarah would know, but she's not here. So, anyways. Um, what about uh, you know, not constructive bounds uh, that don't give an explicit construction? So, this isn't really his argument, uh, if, is not really explicit for getting a coloring. Um, okay, even if it is like but, but we'll see that when we translated it, we were able to make it much more explicit. And that's kind of somehow been very helpful. Yeah, so here we don't really care so much about uh, explicit, just, just constructing a coloring, even if you construct it using prob probabilistic method or whatever, it's fine. The same way with the protocol, we don't really care how long the players have to think to send their bits, we just care about the, the, the bits that are sent. Um, yeah, and for... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and for general K, uh, it was generalizing Bayron in a non-trivial way. You get you get uh, communication upper bounds for for the you know, for the more general version of this uh, of this type. <clears throat> they haven't really changed much since the forties. Um, <clears throat> so for exactly N, which again is an easier communication problem because we saw that you can use Bayron's upper bound to get upper bounds for this problem. So this problem should be 
easier and Hale's Jewett one should be even easier. So we should maybe expect that we, if we're trying to get better protocols, we should maybe expect that we should, you know, that we could do better on these, even though they're also longstanding problems that haven't budged in a while. Um, and so again, the first one was just importing Behrens result to get the protocol for exactly and using the reduction that I gave you. And then, and then this paper, so first I'll show you uh, how uh, with, with Nazi and Adi, we, we kind of constructivize this argument. And then they uh, a really great idea that they actually managed to take that constructive version and improve it and, and do something much smarter. And so it might not look very significant to go from 2.8 to 2.4, but it's the first time there was any, any movement at all. Um, and then, yeah, just this year, Green uh, uh, had a twist on this one. Uh, that, that brought the number down even more. And I'm going to try to give you some idea of how these go. So we think that there's a good opportunity here to, most people I think think the opposite, that Bayron is like, yeah, at least when you read on Wikipedia, it says, well, nobody's improved that. So that's probably the right answer. And there's been a whole lot of work on the other side. But I think we kind of think that, that, we, that we should try harder here. <laughs> yeah, better off balance. Yeah, so the original proof just, uh, you know, like I said, just reduces basically starts, you know, you want to solve exactly, I'm going to describe exactly, so now we're going to talk about these exactly n proofs. So you want to solve exactly n, you show that it reduces to this number in hand degree one zero thing, and then that's equivalent to three AP coloring and Bayron is the one that has this beautiful construction of a, of a three AP free subset of n. So we're going to take that thing, yeah, so, so this theorem just can be applied directly using these reductions to get a protocol. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to first give you a high level of this original construction and then how. And I'm, I'm not going to do numbers because they're, they're kind of ugly, but I'm just going to try to give you the high level idea. Okay, so have you all seen, has any, who's seen Bayron's construction? Anybody? No? Oh, cool. That's great. Oh, it's really Really, it's really beautiful, I think. Um, so, so what I'm trying to do now is just I'm trying to come up with a big subset of n that doesn't have any three AP, three term arithmetic progressions. So the first thing we'll do, given a number x, is we're going to view it as a vector. We're going to write it in base m representation, uh, where m is going to be chosen to optimize the, to minimize the communication cost. Yeah, so anyways, if I pick M to be 16 and N, which is their target, is 300, then we can compute. Yeah. Um, and the basic idea is that once you view things as vectors, if you're, so, um, so you're given these three numbers, X, Y, and Z, and you've converted them to vectors. So X bar, this is like the vector version of X when we write it in base M. Okay, and let's say that that it's it's a is the is the vector, and let's say y is a plus b, and z is a plus two b. So let's say that they form a, a three-term arithmetic progression as vectors over z z to the d. Okay, so here's a, and a plus b gives you y, and another add another b to that, and you get z. Okay, now. The thing that you can use, the really great idea, is that, um, oh, sorry, I didn't, no. So what I want to say is that I didn't say the main point before we get to this. So if these three numbers really are this type, then they can't have the same lengths. Okay, hopefully you can see that by the picture. So when you add B, which is not zero to A, you get some other vector, which could have the same length, but there's no way the third one could also have the same length. Okay. So that means if the players, if when they convert their their x's to vectors, if those vectors, uh, um, if the original numbers were trying to figure out if they're a three-term arithmetic progression, if when you convert them to vectors, you keep the promise that if these were a three AP, then the vectors would be a three AP, then the players could just you know convert their numbers to these vectors and send the length of the vectors. And if the lengths are the same, then they say, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so so now you know that if the lengths, you know, that the lengths are different if and only if they're not a three-term. 
that make sense? <clears throat> so does that make sense? No? Okay, so what's confusing? Oh, it does? It's good? Okay. So the problem is that um, <clears throat> these can be a three-term arithmetic regression over n, or you can even think of it as mod n if you want. Don't worry about the, the wraparound. But it might be that, that these are, are not. In the sense of you might, when you add these numbers as vectors, there might be carries. And that can screw things up. And that can lead to these not being uh, three AP as vectors, even if these are. <clears throat> but all we're trying it's to do almost is almost mod them when you carry over, yeah. but it's not really yeah, because yeah. you go up one. Right? <laughs> so, if it was just about them, it would still work. But... <laughs> yeah. So what what we want to do, we don't it's okay though, because we're just trying to come up with a big set. So what we can do is just pick <clears throat> pick a whole lot of X's that are in, you know, that are in N, and where when you convert them to vectors, say all the coordinates are, are not very big. So if all the coordinates say or magnitude less than m over three, then when you sum them up, you won't get any carries. <clears throat> so we can just, just restrict attention to those x's where the vectors, and there's a lot of those. And then we want to restrict to a specific length. And then we're going to take all the vectors, you know, where all the when you all the x's when you write them into vectors, the the magnitude of all the coordinates is less than less than m over three, and that those vectors all have the same length. And that's going to be the big, the big bear in set. So by restricting to these with this condition, if these are an arithmetic progression, then the vectors will be an arithmetic progression. And then we want to uh, further, uh, you know, then find the, the length, the length so that it's the, it's the most popular length for vectors of this type, okay? And by, you know, by counting again, this, there's gonna be a lot of those for the most popular length, and that's gonna be the, the big the AP free set, okay? And then again, to take this one set and convert it to a color and a protocol, you just do the standard things. But it's not constructive in a lot of ways. Converting from the big set to the coloring is not constructive. And also, since it's a counting argument, it's not, you're not really getting your hands on it. But it's not so, I don't think it's so bad. Um, but but it's still reasonable. Yeah, it's still reasonably expensive. It's like you can, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but let me describe you how how to so that goes through Bayron, and we we wanted a better protocol than Bayron, so we didn't want to go through that. So we started off by trying to come up with the direct protocol for exactly n, not not for solving the Bayron problem. <clears throat> so just like formulate that algorithm as a direct one, um, explicit one. <clears throat> so here's what it looks like. So again, we're trying to solve exactly n, which is equivalent to corners in the number one red model, three numbers x, well, y, and z. And for the corners problem, there was nothing known that is better than that. Correct. And this improves the corners problem. So. This, yeah, the, the follow-up by Daniel Schramm that, that builds on this. But yes. Okay. So the, the, the first improvement, the main, the main result is the Daniel Schramm one. This was like a precursor that, that led to that. And then green uh, was whatever the word for post-cursor. Does <laughs> that work? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So this is going to look a lot like uh, one of the reductions we did. So they have the three numbers x, y, and z, and uh, they're going to compute what you know these x primes, which is what the which is you know the, what x should be. The player who sees y's and z, this is the x, this is the unique x. Give them the answer one. Same thing for y prime. Same thing for z prime. Delta we defined before. It's just n minus this. And t, as we defined before, is x plus t, y plus c. And it's just like before, they compute in the number on forehead model. The player who sees y, z can compute tx. This player who sees x and z, ty. And the third player can compute these. And again, we know that there are three AP by the way we did this. <clears throat> and I don't want to go to, yeah, I'm going to go to number in hand. But, but, the, but you'll see when we get to the improvement, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna actually do something that's gonna not be number in hand. If we switch to number in hand, then we'll be back to Baron, which would be great if we can get an improvement, but we're shooting for something else. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm just gonna explicitly describe this. Like I said, here we are 
it's going to be in the number in hand model. So they computed these num in the because they were in the they are in the number on forehead model, so they can compute these. And now they're going to figure out uh, <clears throat> if these three numbers are equal. And they promised that they form a three-term arithmetic progression. So we're going to do the Bayran trick. We're going to convert them to vectors in base m. So these are numbers, and they convert them to vectors base m. <laughs> and then play, then what they want to do is so these vectors again they with the reason that we that we had trouble before was the vectors might no longer as vectors still be three term arithmetic progressions okay but what we can do is we can we would what we would like to do is for each coordinate we would like to kind of add add a shift uh, to to move that so like or subtract subtract something from there. So when we do that, the, the new coordinate is in between zero and m over three. Okay. Like the, not, not the orthent, but kind of like the orthent, right? I like the... Like the orthent where it, it's not really orthent. Orthent? Orthent is... Oh, orthent. Oh, oh, sorry. Well, that is not really yeah. orthent, right? It's with the space yeah, of the cubes and find which cube... The... Yeah, it's much simpler than that. Yeah. yeah. So basically for, for each of the D... You know, remember, these are numbers... Uh, in m to the d, so it's d coordinates, and each coordinate has a number in, in, in zero through m. So you can think of the num each coordinate. You know, it's like it's either in the the numbers, either in the first third or the second third or the last third. If it's in the first third, you're happy. It's at coordinates, then it's less than m over three. It's the middle third, we're going to subtract m over three from it, and if it's in the highest one, we'll subtract two m over three from it. So that pushes them all. So that's what R is going to be. The first player is going to figure out what this shift vector is. So that T of X, when you subtract this vector from it, it's, it's, it's all the coordinates are small. <laughs> and if these three numbers are the same, then this shift vector will be the same. So the first player computes this unique vector and sends it to the other players. That's going to be costly. <laughs> and oh, now this is nice. And then the other players uh, check to see if they're shift vectors are the same. And if not, then they reject because then they know these three numbers aren't the same. And if they are the same, then, then what we want to do is um, now we can uh, look at, so when you subtract these, these are now, so the original numbers were three-term arithmetic these were three-term, and if the original numbers were, e were equal, if and only if these numbers are equal. So now the players can, what we said before, use the major trick of Bayron, which is, since these numbers as vectors are three term arithmetic progressions, we can just compute their lengths. So the players just send the lengths of their vectors, and if the lengths are all the same, then, then they know, um, then they accept, then they know that the numbers are all equal. Okay. So the cost is, uh, okay, it's not going to not gonna matter too much, but this is going to cost like 2D because it's a vector. Uh, where each coordinate is either you know, 0, 1, or 2. 0 if you leave it alone, 1 if you subtract m over 3, 2 if you subtract 2m over 3. Uh, and then here, the length of the vector is like order log m d, maybe m squared d, but anyways, it ends up being order log m. So if you pick d and m uh, to, to make these two things roughly equal, then you'll end up with the, this communication complexity. Again, I'm ignoring and suppressing the ugly calculations of the constants. But, but there's so whatever that original number was, 2.8 something something. <clears throat> so there's no improvement. Does that make sense? Okay, so now let's talk about, so I'm not gonna give the details, but I wanna give the high level idea of how they improved this. So the main thing that was costly about this protocol was, was, was this. They had to send this entire vector <laughs> of length D, and that was costly, um, like 2D actually. Um, so the way that we're gonna save is, um, so in general, uh, so, so what, they just, what, what they're gonna do instead is argue that they that first find a protocol that works on a constant fraction of all the inputs, okay? and then use a similar kind of translation argument, um, which is gonna cost bits, and it's gonna um, take us back to the number on forehead. So in order to go from a protocol that works on a constant number of inputs to a protocol that works on every input, that's going to use uh, that's going to take us out of the number in hand. Okay. Um, so the main thing is to come up with a protocol that works for a constant number of inputs. 
And the way they do that is that they look at a typical input and look at the that vector r sub x. So for typical input, we want to we want to see like how much entropy the, the distribution is over those vectors. So in general, you know, they can be zero, one, or or two, you know, be two two d bits long. But for for most strings, most of them aren't going to have you know, most of them are going to have, you know, a third many zeros, a third many ones, and a third many two. So the entropy is going to be a lot less than 2D. Okay. And, and so they look at the strings that are typical where the entropy is less than 2D. Again, it's a constant, you know, it's a constant less. It's, I don't know what it is, some, some, something not two, but some other constant less than two. Entity. And so they're going to solve the problem on those using the fact that, that since, since the, you know, on those inputs, which is a lot of them, that you don't really have to send 2D, you can send less because of the entropy small. So they, so that gives them a protocol for the, for solving constant many inputs of cost where the 2D has been made smaller by a constant. And then they, this is like this translation argument that says that if you can solve it, if you have a protocol that solves exactly N on a constant fraction of all inputs, and it has some cost, then there's a, we're back to number on forehead now, protocol that is correct on all the inputs with this much added cost. <clears throat> and I have a slide on this or not. Yeah. So this is not, not very hard. You just, it's, a, it's like a translation argument. You, you um, <clears throat> so you call it, a, so we're gonna look at, what we want to do is find So let S be the inputs where this original protocol pi was correct, the typical ones. So you had a protocol pi that had less communication. It only worked on this constant fraction subset S. And now we want to look at all the other inputs that aren't in S that are in N cross N. And we want to, and we want to come up with a set of vectors, delta, so delta, these are vectors in N cross N, a small set of vectors, so order log N vectors, so that um, when you add, uh, one, so that for every uh, set, it's not S, so for every set, you know, for every, for every vector X comma Y, it might not be an S. When you add, there's some vector from S that you can add, whereas when you add it mod, uh, whatever we're adding mod, that this now, the, the <clears throat> that when you shift the vector by this, you're an S. So we wanna show there's a small number of these shift vectors so that when you take an arbitrary, vec arbitrary vector that might not be an S, and there's always a shift vector in F that you can add to it that'll bring you to a vector in S, in a sense. And it's just like a greedy argument that there's a small number of such vectors that, that do this. It's like a counting argument. <clears throat> um, so given that this set F exists, it's small, the, the, the way that they get the protocol to work for all the inputs is a player who sees, say, Y and Z announces uh, announces the proper shift vector, okay? Um, and this just takes log log this many bits. Um, and then they solve the problem, you know, and then they run the protocol, the original one pi on the shifted version, which is in S. Does that make sense? And the answer will be the same. Is so, so, yeah, so it's important that you add that. So, y and z get shifted by that vector, by some vector in f, that's delta one, delta two. <clears throat> and then this one has to be the x plus delta one, delta two, because you want to see original numbers uh, sum to n, then these shifted ones sum to n. So, you have to, these things have to cancel out. <laughs> So again, it's like from a computer science point of view, these are pretty standard tricks. So, so it's kind of amazing in some sense that that yeah that this was not improved for so long, at least at least from my point of from my naive point of view. <laughs> like the shift technique has been around for a while. I think that what's new here is to is this is you know idea of looking at the yeah looking at the protocol on average. You know, trying to get a protocol that works for some good fraction of them, and then that's all you really need to do by this thing. And for a good fraction of them, you don't really have that full entropy anywhere near 2D. 
Yeah, and then I didn't say anything about green. So, so then green further improves it uh, by by actually doing. Is this is, is it an entropy, also an entropy argument? But it's a more clever uh, more clever way of doing it, where you take differences between two vectors to bring the entropy down even further, so that the numbers are in the middle range between m over three and two m over three. I'll describe that some other time, but it's 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 the same high level, but it's a really nice trick. To, to get that entropy down for the average case. Yeah, I feel like there's lots of things that one could, could try to, to do even better. Um, so that's about all I wanted to so say. What about the RK, the maximum density, maximum size? I mean, the, the problem of the maximum size. Yeah, so size. It's, it's basically you inherit it from this. Uh, so, so, to, uh, to so like, okay. yeah, so if, um, yeah, if, if, um, so if R, if the R, whatever this quantity is, so it, it would be, so I'm going to do 3AP, so it would be, um, you know, so N is the total number of things. And, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to do both ways. Yeah. Yes. So this would be the R value. And on the other way around, if you want to compute the C, you just take, you know, however many have, yeah. So R3 times N times C. So it's going to be N over that. And I don't think that there's much loss here. This is special for. For problems with this additive structure, it's definitely not true um, in general. For problems in communication flexibility, having a big rectangle or big cylinder intersection doesn't always mean that you have a good protocol. But for these problems that have an additive feel to them, the, these shifting kind of tricks work really are, are really great. So, anyways, just some open things we're working on. I think we have it, but still working on it. Trying to general. So, Rankin is the generalization of Bayer more than three players and um, trying to use basically so we have a way to a constructive protocol now for so we're trying to do exactly n for k more than three players using the generalization of so we have Bayren which solved the you know the three ap coloring problem and the Rankin does the same thing but for k ap colorings so we're taking that and we're um uh, coming up with an explicit exactly n protocol using it. And then we want to use the lineal Schreiman entropy trick to Im improve on the ranking results for exactly n. And I think it's working, but <laughs> I don't want to talk about it because I'm not positive. Um, and then Hales Jewett, which is the easiest of the three viewed as in communication terms, can we get a, can we do better for that one? Um, and yeah, there's so many open problems, I'm not really even sure which ones to list. Uh, is there an easier graph function, graph permutation function in this one? Also, like I said before, like when you look at higher k, it brings up these intermediate models between number and forehead and number and hand, where where information is you can view like information sharing by like a bipartite graph of players and and inputs and uh, you know and there's different choices once you you know at the two extremes there's only one choice of what the graph looks like, but when you have like you know. K inputs and each each player sees I don't know some K minus ten of them or something, then you get different ways to to set it up. But I think those intermediate models are interesting to study, especially because we have very little techniques for proving number on forehead results. So I think these intermediate models, uh, I think they're interesting. Yeah, so that's about it. So if I'm trying to sum up things in a very simple manner, you said two things, like among other things you said, but you said the following two things. I like this. Yeah, tell me <laughs> you said that um, for, okay, so what we said before the break is that we know that uh, for a number in hand, if I promise you that the three numbers are coming from some collection of triplets, 
then the communication complexity is equivalent to how many colors uh, I need to color, let's say, the numbers from one to n with all of this collection as forbidden to be monochromatic. Second thing that you showed is that if we have an instance of exactly n, then we can convert this into a number in hand instance in which we know that the instance will be a part of the collection of uh, three arithmetic um, yeah. progressions. So we do have this form. Yes. Question, do you have any other forbidden structures that are not three term arithmetic progression for which you get better bounds, better colorings for the... Uh, yeah. So that's what, so maybe you know, but so exactly in, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but we get better, this stuff gets better bounds for corners. Color and corners. Okay, and good, no, but what I was trying to yeah. say is, do you have any any other collection of three Besides parts? These three. Uh, so, so there would be two parts here, but I'm asking first about the easier part. So you have two parts. Like first of all, you know to, to convert exactly n to corners. You know to convert exactly n to a uh, um, to three term arithmetic progression in that sense. But I'm just asking, is there a collection? triplets that is uh, very large, such that the number of colors you need to prevent a monochromatic thing is uh, much, much uh, lower than what you get for three terms for three term arithmetic progressions. I think I'm somehow missing something about your question. Say it again. You want to know, is there a big I'm saying that there are two things that are happening. Yeah. That are happening here. There are some collections that you subsets collections of triplets, subsets of all triplets in the world, that you know to take an instance of exactly n and convert it to the problem of equality under the promise that the triplet of inputs is within this collection. Mm -hmm. This, for example, includes a three mm -hmm. term arithmetic progression. Mm -hmm. You're asking. I'm asking exactly if there's a different collection of triplets that you can convert this to. That is a better. Oh, or in general, which triplets, which collections of triplets have better coloring? Yeah, that's a good question. This. I mean, I think the partition yes. thing should be another example, but uh, but I don't know if you actually can do better. I don't know if there's any improvements that you don't already get from exactly and further improvements exactly. And, and and in general, I don't. Yeah, I don't. It's a good question. So I guess you're saying. Yeah, just just uh, existentially, like not necessarily something that's studied. And, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. And that's what I'm saying. There's so many good questions. <laughs> and you think that the word Logan should be the correct thing for exactly? I don't know. I would probably say no, but that's just because I feel like I feel like people haven't tried hard enough to get upper bounds in my show. By improved Bayron, maybe I should improve. Or bypass data, really. <laughs> Thanks. All right, lunch time. <laughs>